speech about me, um, I, I mean, I'm most taken back by the fact that you said I was so young, but I will take that and carry that with me. <laughs> uh, that's definitely brightened up my mood. So uh, thank you so much for everyone uh, who is attending, who's taken their time out. Uh, no, no doubt in their busy schedules to come and listen to me speak about this topic. Um, what I'm hoping to do is not be the only person speaking about this topic because my understanding is that we're all in some form of, in some way or another, involved in either teaching or learning. Either we are teachers, we're imparting knowledge, or we are receiving knowledge in some form. So I would really like to open the forum up for us to discuss this further um, in terms of um, in, in more of a Q&A session. So just a few housekeeping points before we start. Uh, so just a big thank you to Lucina and Joanna and generally Mr. Vajoshania Nautichiri Izika Agiski Mokposa Aitefu for holding this, uh, these, this wonderful um, program of webinars that has been going on for quite a few months and for allowing me, giving me the opportunity to speak um, in one of them. Uh, just so you know, the webinar duration, you may have, this may be the first time you're attending one of these, is about an hour. Um, and I aim to present for about 40 minutes, hopefully less, because I would be really keen on us opening up a discussion. Uh, there's quite a few of us, more than I, I anticipated. So I would be very inter interested for us to really sort of share our knowledge, share our views, um, not just based on what I, I'm just hoping that what I'm presenting today will be a catalyst or maybe in some way it will stimulate you to, to think about micro-learning, either implementing it in your own classroom, ecology, or whether you are an LMD professional, or whether you just want to learn something and you don't want to embark on a degree. So, um, okay, so let's, let's get started straight away. So, um, so I want to start with this quote by uh, George Miller, who was a famous, um, a famous uh, psychologist, American psychologist in the 1950s. Uh, he was one of the founders of cognitive psychology. Um, so you may all have heard of CBT. It's quite popular at the moment in terms of psychology. But one of the studies that he did, um, he did in part on was that the brain can only retain five to nine facts before either committing to them, uh, them to long-term memory storage or losing them all together. So I think this is something that I'd just like you to keep in mind as I'm going through the presentation and as you're thinking about micro-learning and as we're discussing it. So something that uh, George Miller pointed out back in the 1950s. Um, so, um, so just to give you sort of an outline of what we'll be looking at today, uh, Lucina has mentioned it, but I'll just reiterate for those who are just joining. So first of all, we're going to be looking at uh, micro learning and trying to understand what that is. We'll be looking at the format and functionality of micro learning, but we'll also be comparing it to macro learning and looking also at elements of nano learning, which is sort of come out off the back of micro learning. Um, we'll have a look at when, when we should use it. So when, when is a good opportunity to use it? And perhaps when we shouldn't use it, uh, what's the evidence that it works? Okay, so we're really looking at, is there any scientific evidence? What, what is the data that this works? Um, a question to you, can you incorporate micro learning into your lessons if you are a, uh, a professional uh, teacher, or or can you incorporate micro less, uh, micro learning into your daily routine as a learner? Um, and also, we'll be looking at how to measure the impact of micro learning. So, uh, a first question to all of you, uh, maybe by a vote of hands. I hope I can see a vote of hands. Um, this is a question. Do you think that micro learning is something new? Is this something that has uh, just come up as a trend? Or do you believe it's been around for a while? Any, any thoughts? 
Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Lucina, if the crowd can speak or engage, or if they can just... Um... If they feel like speaking, they can speak. Yes, so all you need to do, dear participant, is just to unmute yourself and express yourself. If you prefer staying in hiding, kind of, then you can write in the chat box. All yes, members. either in the chat box, a yes or a no. Um, any thoughts? My immediate reflection is that we've all been using it without knowing about it, yes, in many cases. So that is my thought. Okay, yes. interesting. Thanks, uh, Lucinda, for the input. Uh, anyone else who thinks that the sim uh, has a similar thought to feeling to Lucinda around this? Or completely different? I'm not sure if anyone's written anything in the in the chat box. Do you see the chat box or not? Just the, uh, okay, sorry, yes, I've just switched. Maybe an example might could be considered in prehistoric graphisms and paintings. Okay, all right, that's very interesting, Miguel. Uh, no, it's not new. People saying no, it's been around for a while. Okay, hello, okay, sorry. <laughs> I went all the way back to hello. Micro learning isn't new. It's a repackaging of previous learning designs. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to try and, um, sorry, oh, this presentation has jumped a little too, too far. A little too far. Apologies. Uh, yes. So, um, okay, drum roll. So. You were absolutely right. Most of you said that no, the idea of bite sized learning laggards is not new. And you were right in thinking this. Traditionally, it has been called incremental learning. You may have come across this term. But what is new is that it's a tried and tested approach. Um, and it is now applied mostly in the digital world. So that's sort of the, the difference between it. Um, but uh, Let's have a look more into what micro learning is, because actually it goes by quite a few concepts that you may have all heard of. So there are different interchanging names that, um, that have come up. So the, the concept is based on short learning morsels, or you probably may have heard of the term bite-sized learning. That comes up a lot. So bite-sized learning, micro learning, these are very similar concepts. They're the same thing, um, just a different way, a, a different um, a different name for them. Um, it's a learning method where content is provided in small units, chunks. Um, sometimes you can also, it's been called just-in-time learning. Um, it's usually um, measured from two to 10 minutes long. Um, however, what has recently emerged from this is now anything that is around two minutes is no longer considered uh, maybe micro learning, but more nano learning. So if you think of any sort of TikTok video, something that's very short, two minutes long, that where you're learning something, that's been now sort of renamed nano learning. But I suppose it all goes under the umbrella of, uh, of micro learning. Um, micro learning usually should have just one objective at a time. It's more on a need to know rather than a nice to know basis. Um, it could be part of a sequence of a, a larger part of um, a course of materials that are broken up. Um, it, it's, the idea is to flexibly integrate it around your daily workflow or around your classroom uh, workflow. Um, and the idea is to, to be able to have immediate access um, to essential skills and knowledge. So these are sort of the premises uh, as to um, in when formatting, when thinking about <clears throat> micro learning. Um, okay, so we've talked about uh, micro learning, but let's just take a step back um, because, as we've said, micro learning is something that is emerging and um, has emerged. It's been around, we've said, we've identified it's been around for a, a while. It is definitely, I would say, 
something that uh, particularly has been precipitated by the pandemic. As you've all seen, you, you've witnessed, um, you know, over the past two, two and a half years, learning has changed a lot. The way we format it, the, the way we look at it, the digitization of learning has made strides. Um, and that has no doubt been precipitated by uh, the pandemic. But if we take a step back and we look at uh, macro learning, which is sort of the traditional, uh, the traditional form of learning that we've known. So pretty much the sort of, you know, Grecian, maybe Victorian model that we've used. So if we were to compare the two, so, okay, so we've got macro learning. So I want to understand a complex topic. That's when we would look at my, macro learning. Whereas with micro learning, it's something that I need to know, something that I need to know now. Macro learning characterizes itself with hours to days to even years if you want to get a degree, for example. Um, however, with macro learning, we've said something that's more or less under 10 minutes. Uh, macro learning conveys a comprehensive topic or a set of topics, whereas micro learning conveys a specific topic or concept, one at a time, as we've said. Um, it uses, macro learning uses different learning formats, whereas micro learning uses very specific learning formats. Macro learning can consist of micro learning units, so nuggets, as we've, we've mentioned before, whereas uh, micro learning can be a part of macro learning, okay? So those are the, the, the two um, sort of differences uh, between macro and micro. Um, Apologies, uh, I'm having some problems with the presentation. Um, oh, it's jumping. It's not cooperating. Okay, so uh, so what I do want to highlight at the beginning of this presentation is I am in no way, shape, or form. Um, hating on macro learning. Okay, I think that macro learning is essential in 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 a lot of uh, learning situations, and I'm not now um, sort of you know uh, championing that we get rid of it altogether. In fact, I've put an arrow to the left, sort of symbolising that macro learning is something that has come from the past. Micro learning is something that's come recently and it's definitely going to be moving with us um, in the future. However, you know, depending on whether you are an educator yourself, you're a designer, an instructional designer, uh, whether you work at a school or a learning institution of some type or, or a traditional sort of a school or whether you work in uh, the learning and development department in a corporation, um, it is worth having, you know, being aware of the fact that you've got the le macro learning element and micro learning, and then deciding if there is a way that you can blend the two, well, I would say powerful learning approaches together to create something that's impactful and engaging for your learners, for whoever your learners are. Um, and then depending, maybe, it will be in the middle, maybe it will move a little bit to one side, maybe maybe it might move completely to the other. So that's for you to decide where that happy medium is. But once again, I'm not advocating that we completely, um, you know, overlook macro learning altogether. Um, all right, so, so some of the formats, uh, so I was talking about, different types of formats of uh, micro learning. Now, um, as I've said, most of micro learning has taken on a digital format, um, but these are some just, just some examples. Uh, I'm sure you could think of a lot more. There are a lot more um, examples, but these are sort of the most common ones. So uh, one of the most common ones are uh, micro courses. So this is something that I definitely um, have uh, had a big out in professionally, so I have developed quite a lot of uh, micro courses, and around that, of course, is a whole um, instructional design model that is used, and different types of models and theories uh, in order to to get it right. So that is one format, micro courses. But of course, 
there's, there's, there's a whole variety of other ones. So we've got images, we've got short videos, audios, games, quizzes, short, uh, short podcasts, and the list can go on. But this is just to give you a taste, an idea. Um, of course, let's not forget about um, social media, which of course is an integral part of our lives. Um, so, you know, a lot of this has been um, has been sort of brought on from uh, from um, micro learning has sort of been brought on by these social media platforms as well. Um, so they sort of interchange. So we're accustomed to bite sized content. And I think this format resonates with the way we like to consume information today. You know, we are time poor. All of us are time poor. You know, we all suffer from time crunch. So, you know, and other ways where we could potentially either gain knowledge um, as the sort of knowledge uh, consumer, gain knowledge input, or whether we design different learning experiences for our students or for employees in, uh, in offices. Um, you know, we mustn't forget about these sort of learning opportunities that are out there. So things like YouTube videos, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, these are not just fun and games. These are, these are great tools that if they're used correctly can be very engaging and powerful uh, micro-learning uh, opportunities. Um, some more interesting points. So, if you if you are thinking about uh, integrating micro learning into your own classroom, um, or you're thinking of engaging in micro learning as a learner, um, you know maybe there are some really interesting points that I will bring up here that could you know um, encourage you, or maybe you're already doing it and you're a big fan. Or maybe you're not convinced, you're still quite skeptical. Um, so let's have a look a little bit more at um, some points and data around this. So first and foremost, you don't need a specialist platform to create micro learning opportunities. I, uh, in my professional, um, in, you know, in my profession, I use um, an e-learning platform to create courses. Uh, however, the micro learning opportunities are everywhere. And as I said, you don't have to embark on learning how to build a micro course to be able to, um, to develop um, interesting and engaging micro learning opportunities for your learners. Um, what we do need to remember is um, that the knowledge when we are designing a course, a micro learning opportunity, not a course, sorry, a micro learning opportunity, needs to be clearly imparted with a condensed time frame in mind. Um, a good thing to remember is that um, studies show that uh, these short learning units are more appealing to learners and therefore learners are more motivated and engaged in these type of learning. Um, opportunities. Um, there's flexibility around this, so you can use a variety of formats. I've just mentioned a few, but I'm sure that when we come to the sort of a, a, a Q and a session, you'll be able to, to give me far more examples around this. So there's a, there's a flexibility around that. It is uh, efficient because we've got the learning time is far shorter and the scalability of it. So once this is created, digital units can be used over and over again. Um, so, you know, there are some interesting points there to consider, um, but also we need to think about when is a good time to use micro learning? Okay, so we've gotten to a point where, okay, I might start using this, but, but but when should we use it? When it when is when is the right time to use it? In what type of situations? So we have to bear in mind that we're using micro learning when we want to reinforce or refresh existing knowledge. Um, we want to maybe customize learning. Okay, so micro learning is a great opportunity to customize, and you know generally you've all probably you know you know, you've you've seen this yourselves, you're noticing this, that we are moving away from this type of learning of one size fits all approach. Unfortunately, with micro, uh, macro learning, 
um, more traditional learning. That was the mode. That was the way you know things were done. But now with sort of micro learning, a one a one size fits all approach. Um, doesn't have to be that it can be something that is more customized to the learning needs to the learning um, diversities that we have um, any type of learning disabilities so the flexibility around that um, particularly when dealing with short attention spans I think this doesn't just resonate with um, children or teenagers as we've always thought I think you know we have to also look at ourselves I think the environments we live in, I most certainly feel that my attention span is far shorter than it used to be. I think that's a lot to do with the way we're responding to um, information, the overload of information that we get. Uh, so we need to consider that when we are designing um, learning materials, um, you know, really thinking about our audiences and really, you know, the time realistically if we're designing something will that student be able to engage and retain that information or is it information overload and we're overwhelming the student mm -hmm. um so because we want to prevent burnout this is a big issue if especially if you are designing things for professionals who are already very busy they're already overwhelmed how do you how do you design, um, you know, lifelong learning uh, programs, courses that, you know, won't be a burden uh, to, to staff? Um, we also, you know, when we're looking at it, it's great to break down key skills with micro-learning. So that's a really good way to, to sort of subdivide it. Um, looking at answering questions in quick, accessible ways. So that's an, a, a good way to uh, do micro learning uh, segments. Um, and we have to think about it as something where people are looking at it as a quick break from everyday tasks so that it doesn't overwhelm the learner, as I've said before. So something that is a quick break, something that is relatively enjoyable, and it's got that one a learning objective in mind where you will get a clear and precise learning outcome. Because as, as most of you know, who are learning um, professionals, you can have your learning objective, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the learning outcomes will be the same as the learning objectives. So when shouldn't I use micro learning? when shouldn't we um well micro learning isn't suited to complex topics um so where many elements must be understood individually and brought together so it's probably not the best way to do it um uh, to implement it and where in-depth personal reflection is required so these are situations where i found that personally as well that micro learning has fallen short so as I'm a big fan of micro learning if you haven't already noticed. However, I do have to admit that there are some shortcomings in terms of micro learning. So things to consider. And I'm sure that when we have our QA session, some of you may you know, also have other comments around this. So please um, keep this in mind. But we do have evidence that it works. I'm a, I'm a um, data-driven person, so I like to have stats and facts. Um, but there, so here we have it. We do have some stats and facts. Um, so according to the Elan benchmarking study and Thrive My Way, um, so this was the most recent study, um, micro-learning can be easily integrated into a daily working routine. So this is more for our maybe um, more for our adult learners. Um, it increases motivation. So it shows that 69.8% um, of students are more motivated when they have shorter segments of things to learn and one learning objective at a time. Um, a 10 minute micro learning course has a completion rate of about 83% which uh, you know is is a great great statistic because of course one of the key issues we have around 
learning um, learning um, segment is, or whether it's courses or modules, is the retention rate. So getting students to complete courses um, or to get them back um, uh, because sometimes they leave them. How do we get them to come back and finish the course? Um, where traditional courses, so the macro learning courses, are much lower in percentage in terms of completion rates. Uh, micro learning has uh, has been demonstrated to boost retention rates by twenty five percent, and completion rates for micro learning modules are high, as we've said. So, so. There are, you know, a lots of um, there's there's quite a lot of data out there. There's a lot more. I've just chosen these because these were the most um, up to date that I found. Um, however, you know, um, you know the 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 numbers speak for themselves here. So, <clears throat> but I think let's move away from numbers for now. Excuse me, and um, let's have a look into some into some studies. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, so um, I think some of you are quite familiar with this study. So um, in the 1900s, a German psychologist called Dr. Hermann Ebbinghaus um, developed um, developed uh, a theory developed a theory around um, the, the 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 learning curve and the acquisition of learning and how quickly we forget things when we when we learn new things. So I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but this was his his diagram, um, and it was really looking at the learning curve when acquiring new information and skills. So what um, Ebbinghaus found was knowledge was lost over time if not continuously supported or put into practice. So in order to consolidate knowledge, it must be repeated, relearned, reviewed, and reapplied. Um, a lot of learning apps are currently you know, sort of engaging in this, in this model. Um, so Duolingo is a sort of, I'm sure you've all heard of the Duolingo app, which is very much the model is about repeating, learning, reviewing materials in very short segments. So Actually, Duolingo's entire model, learning model, is based around, um, you know, repetition, and you know, you know, has taken elements of of this study, this this forgetting curve. Um, also, spaced repetition. So this is sort of very much linked to this forgetting curve. So you may have heard of spaced repetition. Maybe you apply it yourself. Or maybe you're not even aware that uh, you, maybe you are doing it with certain aspects of your learning. Um, but space repetition is a way of remembering things based on the concept that learning in, is enhanced when knowledge is repeated after certain intervals. So, you know, space learning breaks down long courses, modules into several sessions or shorter durations with, with spaced intervals in between. So, Basically, learning something in increasing intervals over a long period of time is far more effective. And there have been numerous studies done around this that shows that this is a proven theory that, you know, if you repeat, so as I said, Duolingo is a good um, example of this as well. Um, you know, if you're repeating shorter segments, then you have a, a bigger chance of retaining this information for a long period of time as well. And um, so when we're looking at um, designing uh, micro courses, because I, I know this audience is very vast, so I, I know that in some way or form you are all in, in education or you know, at some point we've all you know, educated ourselves. So education is something that we've all been touched by. Um, but maybe there might be some of you out there who um, are thinking of designing micro courses, whether that is online um, or whether you are already doing this. Um, so a good thing always to remember, sort of a basic baseline when you're designing micro courses is making sure that you have an introduction and learning objectives, a carefully planned structure, 
knowledge checks, so obviously assessing if um, student um, student uh, assessing the uh, sorry the uh, information the the knowledge along the way, and also a summary. So sort of the basic building blocks of you know designing any type of sort of micro course. Um, okay, so moving on to measuring the impact. So this is quite important because of course at the end of the day, you know, we could have the best intentions, we could uh, you know put a lot of time into designing uh, learning opportunities. However, you know, we need to make sure that our students are really learning and that there is an impact on their learning. Um, and you know, obviously that is measured through assessments, feedback, there are different obviously ways that we can we can measure this. Um, but really the best way, uh, you know, in, in terms of measuring uh, any type of learning element that you're doing is start with your organizational aims, organizations aims and objectives, schools aims and objectives. So we start from that, making sure that we have these clear in our head, in mind, when we're putting together or designing any type of um, learning opportunity. Um, so this brings me to um, the four levels of the Kirkpatrick model, which sort of, uh, this was a model that was developed um, in, the, uh, in the 90s, in the early 90s, and really looked at measuring sort of impact um, of learning and sort of the steps to take to see uh, whether um, whether you know the impact was um, you know achieved. So really looking at different levels of this pyramid. I'm I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this. So first and foremost, we all we always want to know did the learner enjoy the training? So we can we can get that from. Um, their reactions, uh, their feedback, um, their engagement. So, so this is something that we can measure. Um, and, and no doubt we all do this, whether it's surveys, whether it's just questions, uh, focus groups, um, depending on your organization, that will, that will look differently. Um, did the learning transfer occur? So we have to sort of really uh, try to see, you know, these are sort of the elements of, of, of measuring this impact and asking the question, did the learning transfer uh, occur? So really, you know, um, is did your students learn what you had set out? How, you know, do you have evidence whether, how do you measure that? Do you, is it through tests? Um, is it through short quizzes? Um, you know, what are, what are the results of that learning? The next step would be, did the training change behavior? So whatever the objective was, did the students in the end learn something new? Has this enhanced in any way their knowledge? Um, has it given, made a change for them? In their lives, whether it was a skill, has it taken them a step to where they needed to go, or more steps? Um, and did the training influence performance? So that's depending on organizational metrics, matrices, and um, a variety of other things. So looking more at results more closely. So tests, looking at whether those learning objectives had have aligned with the learning outcomes. Um, a little bit further, a little bit later on, um, the um, Phillips sort of added a next step to this model, which was uh, a little bit more looking at sort of the corporate element of learning and development. So, so for program evaluation. So at the top, you can see it's looking at return on investment. So really it was the training that was provided, you know, did, did you know, was, was it worth the money that an organization spent on, on developing these resources? So that was another sort of measure that was, was added um, to, to the pyramid, so it, it ended up having sort of five stages. Um, okay, 
so the question is further evidence of whether this works. So does micro learning improve knowledge transfer and outcomes is really the question. So on its own, a short piece of con content has no real advantage over a long piece. So that's why, you know, at the very beginning, I didn't, I didn't want it to seem like I completely excluded macro learning out of the mix or any sort of longer traditional forms of, of learning. But as part of a well thought out sequence, it can be highly effective um, because it has been proven to be effective and accessible. And we know that with the space repetition, it's an it's an excellent tool for learning. So it all makes sense because we've got quite a lot of evidence. We've got, you know, we've got studies and models that micro learning has been based on. Um, so it's to give us that confidence that actually, you know, this isn't just a trend. This is based in science. Um, it's been proven to work. Um, and it's not just you know, I believe that this is a this is a this is a not just a trend. It's something that's here to stay. And um, you know, if we look at the concept of lifelong learning, and which is really where a lot of learning is moving to, realistically, um, you know, if you are a professional, uh, you know, and you know, the organisation is really looking to get their return on investment. Uh, you know, you have to think about design and uh, realistically how much knowledge uh, someone can can uh, take on, taking at, a, at a, you know in certain points of time. So you know, the length of the length of that uh, course that you are designing for someone who is office based and has a lunch break that maybe they don't always take. But they do need to um, learn a new skill. It is part of um, <clears throat> it's part of their objectives uh, that they have to reach. There, that we all have to do some element of learning and development. So these are realistic, um, realistic sort of you know um, designs that will work for the busy, busy uh, you know. Uh, corporate person um, or people who are in organizations, teachers who are teaching themselves also have to embark on professional development. Teachers are extremely time poor as, as you all know. So, you know, realistically, um, you know, is it easier to embark on you know, bite-sized knowledge rather than, you know, long degrees alongside a very heavy, um, you know, sort of, um, heavy work schedule. So to summarize, um, so micro learning can be any format as long as it's short. Um, we've we've decided, you know, we've looked at some evidence. It can be very effective, particularly as part of a series. Um, you can use uh, you can use uh, I I use something called uh, Nimble. Uh, it's an e-learning platform that I use to build short courses. If anyone is interested in um, speaking to me about this later, I'm very happy to give you some information and um, contact details as to who I deal with in Nimble. If your organisation might be interested in. Um, acquire in a um, buying license for an e-learning uh, platform. I would definitely uh, recommend them. Um, and uh, of course, as with any training, it's important to, to measure impact. So just on a final, final note, um, I found this quote um, sort of this morning um, um, on the World Economic Forum um, website. And um, I was just thinking about obviously this presentation and education and really looking towards the future in a positive way, uh, despite the fact that we've got a lot of overwhelming evidence that uh, a lot of things are sort of happening that are maybe overwhelming us. Uh, I was looking at more the, in the realm of education um, and really looked at this whole uh, 
quote that I've shortened for the purpose of this presentation is really, you know, we are now in the fourth industrial revolution. And thinking about that, what does that mean for us as educators, as learners? So, um, you know, it, the fourth industrial revolution represents a fundamental change in the way we live, work and relate to one another. It is a new chapter in human development enabled by extraordinary technology, uh, technology advances. The speed, breadth and depth of this revolution is forcing us to rethink how organizations create value and even what it means to be, to be human. The fourth industrial revolution is about more than just technology-driven change. It's an opportunity to help everyone, including leaders, policymakers, and people from all income groups and nations to harness uh, coverage, uh, coverage technologies in order to create an inclusive, human-centered future. And I think for me, when I was looking at this in the aspect of um, of learning and the future of learning, uh, I was thinking very much about you know uh, student centered learning. I think this is something that you know um, we need to consider. And I think if we if we look at my, uh, micro learning and the opportunities to customize things and to work around um, our learners' needs. And um, and how um, they are learning, and the, the different sort of diversities of learning, and, and and for it to fit into our learners' everyday work life life, then um, we really need to sort of you know think about. I think micro learning really fits this very well. So I think for me. Um, this is kind of where, you know, we've got this picture of, you know, obviously a Victorian, very traditional classroom and, you know, looking more towards, you know, um, a different type of learning, a different type of, you know, something where we all have to move in this direction. I think we are all responsible for moving in this direction, for moving away from outdated learning models that no longer really apply to where we are at the moment um, as learners, whether it's children at schools, whether it's learners in the office, whether it's teachers. Um, so I really feel like um, you know, we need to have this more student-centered learning approach. And I feel that micro-learning really um, plays to this. So that's really um, sort of it from me. I'm not even aware of how much time we have left. Oh, uh, not a lot. I talked a lot. Um, so I think that leaves us with around 15 minutes. Am I right, Rutsana? It is. You are absolutely right. Uh, approximately right. 15 minutes. So it's I a lost. I lost, um, you know, sort of the sense of time. Um, okay, so um, just any sort of, I would really welcome the last 15 minutes of not listening to my own voice anymore and really uh, hearing from others and just your thoughts and ideas. Um, just, you know, what, what you would, what you could add to this discussion. Yes, you can unmute yourselves and let's let's just let's just maybe see each other. <laughs> yes, I'm happy to stop sharing. Right. Okay. Hello, so I can see everyone. All the 40 participants. Hello. Uh, I see that some of you have already visualized yourselves and remained visualized during the during the webinar. So maybe you could be the first ones just to reflect on what you've we've all just been listening to. Anita, maybe. Um, hello. Good evening. 
Good evening. Hi, hi Anita. Hi. Um, greetings from Croatia. Oh, hi. <laughs> Brilliant. But I'm of Polish origin, so I'm Slavic mix. <laughs> oh, great. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so the hardest question for me, or <laughs> sorry, did, did you have a question, Anita? No, no, no. I said I said the hardest question is on me because the reflection of all. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I was enjoying, uh, to be honest, um, um, this term micro learning uh, was not very familiar for me, uh, although I've been using it as all of us. And I think um, the new generations and uh, the new way of teaching should consist of uh, micro learning because our children I teach in primary school. Uh, I mean, like um, lower secondary because we have got um, old um, old system from first to eighth grade um, students. I teach English and German. Uh, so I think um, they learn in different way they um, are not concentrated like uh, generations before. So I make combinations between uh, digital stuff, like 25% each class, and the rest is like combination of uh, pair work. Um, I strive to omit uh, this frontal teaching, but, but I cannot uh, say that I don't use it because it's, like um, the old traditional way of teaching. Sure, sure. So maybe you are more, um, you know, combining the two. Yes, like yes, we have definitely. that circle that you know yes. you found your your happy sort of medium, whatever works for your unique, um, you know, classroom ecology because they're all unique, right? Yes, yes, definitely. Brilliant. Okay, well, I, I'm glad that, uh, you know, that that you've learned something today, yes. and that it's really great that you've been, you know, using this, uh, despite the fact that you didn't know the term, but you know, the, but you have been doing it, which is great because a term is just a term, but you know, you've been doing it. It seems that you've been doing it successfully, and that your students are, um, you know, responding well to this. So yes. you know, it's a win. It's definitely a win. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who would like to? Maybe Tomek. Yes, Tomek in, on my screen, Tomek is next to Anita. <laughs> so being the neighbor of Anita, who was the bravest one, you will be the second bravest person on the list of participants. Uh, hello for Basically, everyone. Whoever's showing a video of themselves. <laughs> uh, hello for everyone. So. I'm not English teacher because I'm a, a doctor of veterinary medicine, and I'm a, I'm a teacher a veterinary a technician subjects uh, yes. to uh, veterinary and technician uh, students uh, in a high school, so the type of secondary school, yeah, uh, in Poland. But uh, I would like to use the English language to my lessons, and for example, I have for two or five minutes to about of English subjects, English words. In, <laughs> so it's a very, very important uh, that uh, what we're talking about today. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to say a uh, very thank you for this subject. <laughs> thank you. You are you. most welcome, Tomasz. And I think what you've said, if I've understood correctly, if yeah. you want in elements of English language into yeah. your classroom, although it's not an English language um, class per se, I think yeah. those micro learning elements would fit so well into that they would slot in perfectly into into your you know situation into your class and into the curriculum. So um, I think that would personally, I think that would be a great um, sort of way to add you know, chunk bite size sort of sessions because obviously English language is not the focus, the main focus, yeah. <laughs> but it's very it's an important element. So I think that would, you know, lend itself very, very well. So yeah, it's yeah, a true, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah. I'm I'm happy, I'm happy to hear that, you know, this is maybe, you know, helped you 
think about. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Tomas. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. One, one important message. Next week, there will be another webinar which may be related uh, to what Tomek is doing, namely that will be the webinar by uh, uh, Evan Frendo, and he will talk about, I wrongly pasted uh, the topic, so that will be English as a business lingua franca, yes? So that is also for technical education and so on. So welcome to the next webinar as well. Brilliant, sounds very yes. interesting. Sorry, I'm just going to have a look into the chat because yes, maybe so there's so someone who, I mean, maybe people have written something in the chat. Um, okay, so I'm just... Uh, there, is an, uh, there is a question I've just noticed. Are yeah. you aware of any software, let me see, of any software apps that could facilitate writing and micro learning. That is, that is a question from Andrzej. That could facilitate writing and micro learning mm -hmm. apps per se, or um, e-learning platforms. So, would it be in terms of um, designing? Or, sorry, Andrzej, I'm not sure where you are. But um, did, would you mean in terms of designing? Um, or yes, or maybe can, uh, uh, can we use right? But that is another question. Uh, but maybe, uh, maybe let's do it this way. We will ask Andre to okay. add some more, uh, uh, some specific questions, and in the meantime, let's concentrate on the next question. From uh, uh, Amail, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, can we use micro, uh, micro learning in corporate training? I'm sure we can, but. Oh, absolutely. Yes, um, <laughs> absolutely. In fact, I would strongly encourage it because, uh, you know, um, in corporate training, very often uh, it depends on, I mean, obviously it depends on uh, whether it's language learning or whether it's learning skills um it depends um you know if if your if your manager requires you to do a master's degree could be that could be to get to sort of help you enhance and get a promotion then you know the micro learning element you're moving more to a macro learning um but tradition but most certainly i can say because i've been working in this industry now for three years that most organizations um, and I think, you know, this trend is only going to keep going, uh, is looking at bite-sized learning simply because, you know, as, as I mentioned in the presentation, people are time poor, um, you know, realistically, if you're already, you know, working full time, you know, how realistic is it for you to later, you know, get home uh, and sit down or during your lunch break and learn for hours and hours on end? So it's not really sustainable, um, and studies have shown that a, a lot of uh, plus uh, learning and development courses that were very long that didn't really follow the micro learning um, you know, uh, format, uh, the retention rates just dropped. And um, in fact, a lot of people didn't even finish these courses. So this was, you know, there's a return on investment. You know, the pyramid that I showed, where it just showed, you know, that. This was not a well spent resource uh, by, uh, you know, by a corporation. So they're moving to these bite sized models because they are attainable. Um, you know, and really, um, you know, we're looking at 20 minute segments, maximum 20 minute segments, and not even every day. So they need to be realistic, bite sized, um, because firstly, time but also realistically you know how much of that knowledge will you retain and then be able to you know um bring back up when you need right so um so yeah definitely that is the big trend yeah uh, in the meantime i received a question about the recording of the webinar as usual it's uh, available on our youtube channel so no problem there is also live stream session on on facebook but there is one question that i skipped and that yes. is around 21 uh, 20 let me go back apologies to the author of the question 
Uh, the question is, can we use it in, wait a minute, high school for, for uh, writing classes, something like this? I'm searching for the exact question. Uh, I I'm also trying to find it. Um, what? I'm, I'm not sure if it's the um, if it's exactly uh, that question. Yes. But what yes. Can micro learning improve uh, uh, in teaching of writing at junior secondary level? That's the one. So that is a question asked by Arpita. If I'm if I'm mispronouncing your name, apologies. But we are such an international community, so uh, it's difficult sometimes. I mean, I believe why not? It, as long as it's as long as we're looking, I think it would best lend itself if it's a writing class. I think it would best lend itself if we if you break down the elements of what you want to achieve in that particular writing segment. So you know, will it lend itself to to talking about writing a full essay one at a you know in an entire lesson? No, because then you're going into sort of macro learning territory. But if it's something to, you know, to do with an aspect, an element of writing, whether it's a style, whether it's just looking at one paragraph or role play, um, dialogue. So it depends on the type, but you could, as long as you break it down and maybe it's something that's condensed, that's very, maybe you've realized, okay, my whole uh, class have, uh, do not understand how to structure a paragraph. OK, um, and I can see that this is a big problem. They don't know how to do a, a structure of paragraphs. They don't know how to start a, a, para, a, a paragraph with a topic sentence. Right. So they're not putting in that topic sentence, which is the crucial part of starting a, a, a paragraph. So then you could break that down and really do a segment on 10 minute micro learning segment on topic sentences and how to write a topic sentence. And that is essentially really looking at just one element, one piece of, you know, a very small element, but a crucial element, because really, you know, if you haven't got your paragraph structured correctly um, and they are not starting with topic sentences, then that whole piece of writing, um, you know, will not, will not be written well. So if you find a way where you can break it down into smaller elements, something that's digestible, um, then I don't see why not. I think it's all about, you know, creativity, thinking about things, breaking it down, pinpointing what the main issues are and what to concentrate on. So I see why, I don't see why not. That's what I would do um, in a writing class as a micro-learning task. There is another question. Do you believe that with the rise of AI, oh my goodness, it jumped. <laughs> there is another one added and I just began reading it. Do you believe? Yes, I'm back. Uh, with the, with, oh my goodness, why does it keep jumping? Uh, so with the rise of artificial intelligence, we will be able, yes, and chat GPT and others could be used to build these small packet learning lessons. Yes, that's an interesting question that Miguel has um, asked. And um, at the moment, who? I mean, I think that we're just at the precipice of what AI can do. It's already scaring me a little bit. Um, I think that at the moment, uh, I think we are looking a little bit as educators at AI in a bit of a and chat, especially with the rise of chat. Uh, GPT a little bit negatively because of course in terms of um, you know problems uh, in terms of uh, cheating and uh, you know an AI platform being able to write an entire essay and maybe there will come a point where us you know AI will be so sophisticated that we might not um, you know be able to pick up on the fact that uh, this has been written not by our students. So I think at the moment, we as educators are approaching it with a lot of caution. We're quite scared because we have to think about how we can safeguard, um, you know, our assignments, assessments, so that they are not uh, written by AI. But I think that AI can bring with it a lot of learning opportunities 
And it's not just something where, you know, um, is a plagiarism uh, and a plagiarism tool. Um, but uh, so it really depends on the direction that AI goes. But I do feel that, um, you know, uh, there, there could be this element of really, um, you know, developing small learning segments. Uh, it depends, you know, how sophisticated AI gets. And very, you know, you may very well have a virtual, virtual AI teacher who will be giving you little micro learning sessions. Uh, why not? Uh, that could be very much inbuilt in the program, but when that will come and how effective that will be um, remains to be seen, I think. But interesting food for thought. In the meantime, there was a question about the certificate. So I, I have just provided it once again, yes? So that if somebody has not managed to, uh, to, to find it, it's there, you can find it right now, 2132, yes? So <laughs> that's, that's where the second uh, option of downloading the certificate is. Okay, so all questions beautifully answered. We are on the road uh, towards uh, uh, managing all those new tools and all the new opportunities with artificial intelligence and chat GPT. So we, you know, in my opinion, the best thing to do is just to stay networked. Yes, stay together because on our own, it would be really impossible to catch up uh, with all the changes taking place uh, in the world as such, but uh, specifically also in the area of uh, teaching English. So thank you, Marianna, for inspiring us tonight. Uh, so we will have something to reflect upon. And I hope that you will continue uh, de uh, dealing with this subject and sharing your precious expertise with us in future webinars. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Lucena. Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for their time today. And I just want to reiterate what Lucena said that, you know, we are all learning. I mean, these, this is day to day. This, you know, yes, I have, you know, I am a certain subject expert and I've been dabbling in this, but really the, the pace is so fast and it's so fast changing that the best thing we can do is really learn from each other and have these sort of sessions where, you know, one person says to the other, hey, I just found out this. What do you guys think? What are your thoughts? Have you heard of this too? So I think this is where, you know, the most important thing is that we come together because really it is changing literally day to day. So yes, thank you again for, for this evening and for coming to my presentation.